Hallelujah. Can I hear the chosen generation say hallelujah? hallelujah. And the royal priesthood say amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, this is your time, this is your people, this is your place. You are the God of the universe and we exalt you. Everything, Father, that we do is to your honor and to your glory. For you have brought us into your family. You have called us sons by adoption and we receive it gladly. We know who we are because of who you are and who you say that we are. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So this morning we want to talk about Victory in my identity. Victory in my identity. And you'd have heard from 1 Peter chapter 2 a bit of that. We're a chosen generation in God. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, unusual people. We are not commoners. God has made it so. And he has made it so because he himself is unique. He is the awesome God. And we want to start by understanding who God is. Who God is. Because then only then can we understand who we are. Hallelujah. And so when we try to describe God, we hear things like, how does he describe himself emotionally? He says he's a loving God. He's a jealous God. He says he's a kind and merciful God. When we speak about God's character, we say he's true and he's righteous. When we speak about his ability, I've already declared it and we have heard it in the songs, that he's powerful, he's strong, he's mighty. What about his genesis, his genealogy? Well, he has no father and no mother. He's the ancient of days. He's the alpha and he's the omega. He is from eternity to eternity. Hallelujah. And so you can understand that when God says in Genesis 1:26. Let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Then you must believe that in some ways we are created for greatness. You must believe that if God is all that he says he is, and all that we know he is, that we too are created to do great things. And yet somehow, sometimes we define ourselves in very narrow channels, in very small perspectives, one-dimensional sometimes. So if I was to say to you, who are you anyway? Who are you anyway? You might begin to say, well, I'm a smart person. I'm a strong person. You might say, well, I'm a handsome guy or a beautiful woman. You might even want to start to answer that question by saying, well, I'm a doctor, you know, I'm a policeman, I'm a nurse, and that's okay. These are ways that we can define ourselves. You might even want to start talking about your social activities. So you might say, well, I'm a socialite, you know. Or you might say, well, I'm a loner, I'm not much into the gatherings and stuff. I like my own space, so, you know, I'm going to just keep it there. But those are really just very small descriptions very small part of who we are and in fact it's very temporal it's very superficial it's very temporary because you see in seasons of our lives that can be like leaves that fall off a tree dry up and is blown away in a short season so that cannot be our full identity there must be something deeper than that so if I ask you again, so who are you anyway? What else is there to you? Maybe you might think about it a little bit more and say, well, you know, the psychologist would say I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert. Okay, you're getting deeper. You might say that I'm a man of integrity or I'm a woman of significance because now you're beginning to talk about your beliefs, your, your mindset, your worldview, the things that you hold dear to, the things that drive you. You might even say I'm a passionate person. You know, you're passionate about justice, you're passionate about young people, you're passionate about the word. And that speaks to your soul, the things about your heart. And those are deeper still, and they describe a little of who you are, 
but there's still more than that about you. And so if I ask you again, who are you really? You might say, well, David, I asked you that question twice, so he must be digging for something else. So you might go to your genealogy. I say, well, I'm a Barrett. You know, if you're an Israelite, you might say, I'm a son of Abraham, you know, because you figure that is part of your identity. It is part of your identity. But then in church or in another setting, you might say, ah, there's a spiritual dimension that maybe I haven't answered yet. There's a deeper part of my identity because I am spirit. Before you came out of your mother's womb, you were a spirit. God spoke to Jeremiah and said, before you were formed, I knew you. He spoke to David and said, before your being was knitted together, I knew you. So he existed before he actually took his first breath. He was a spirit. And when we die and when they die, we will still be spirits. Therein is a permanent dimension of who we are. So if I asked you the question again, I think like any good GSAT or common entrance students, you could say, all the above, teacher, all the above. <laughs> I'm all the above. I'm a little bit of what I do. I'm a little bit of what I know. I'm a little bit of what drives me. I'm a little bit of the passion that is in me. I'm a little bit of my last name, my, my family line. I'm a little bit, and then I would stop you because I would say, spirit, you're a lot of spirit. You are spirit, and you're just passing through this world, and all the other things that you describe are just the things that connect you here and make you functional here. And Paul describes it this way in Philippians 3, 5 to 6. He said in the letter to the Philippians, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. What was he talking about? His genealogy. And then he says, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. So now he's talking about perhaps an occupation, something that he was good at, that he studied to do and to know how to function in that space. And then he said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now he's talking personality, because he was a passionate, on fire, no nonsense, knock it down if you talk too long kind of guy. You know, that's Paul, his passion. And then he said, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So he's talking his spiritual dimension. So you see, even Paul did, me miss, me sir, all the above, all the above. But spiritually, if you are born again, the most important part of your identity is tied up in the scripture we read this morning. First Peter 2, 9, which says, you're a chosen generation. God came out of his way to find you, to tag you, and to pull you in. And then he said, you are a royal priesthood. You are a priest to him. And he crowns you in that context. And then he says, you are a part of this holy nation, a peculiar people. So now you can say, I too am a part of seed of Abraham. I too am a son of God by faith. I am walking in the light that God gives. I have access to God as a royal priest and in a special way. I am rooted and I'm grounded in Christ. Ephesians 3, 14 to 17 tells us, I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water that produces good fruit in its season, whose leaves shall not wither, and whatever I do shall prosper. That's Psalm 1, 3 to 4. All of those things speak about who you are. So with this identity, how do we experience victory in every aspect of our lives? Because this is what we want to talk about this morning. This is what I trust and I'm looking to the Holy Spirit to place deep in your spirit the victory in your identity. So if you know who you are, you can be victorious in hardship. So just say with me, I can be victorious in hardships. 
I can be victorious in hardship. You see, in life, hardship must come. Must come. But we must endure, as the word says in 2 Timothy 2 to 3, we must endure as good soldiers. And because we identify as priests and sons and daughters of the king, then we also have access to the resources of heaven. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians 4 tells us we can do all things. So if you look at Philippians 4, 6 to 7 and 10 to 13, you realize that we often use the scripture where we're talking about achieving targets, about getting promoted, about other things that, you know, have the, the glory and the, the things that we desire. But when you read the scripture, Paul says, I've learned to be abased, and I've learned to abound, I've learned to lack, and I've learned to have plenty. He was saying, in the midst of the most difficult experiences, I can do all things through Christ. So already you're beginning to see God's plan of victory for you. In the midst of your hardest times, in the midst of your lack, in the midst of your needs, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God is your father and he gives us a purpose that he wants us each one to fulfill. He's not short of paper as it were and names and each one of us have our own purposes to fulfill. So we can't let hardship stop that because that's not a surprise to God. God already knows that's coming. We have to go all the way through. There's a, a song that says, um, when you catch hell, don't stop. Uh -huh. When you're going through hell, don't stop. All the way through, because at the end of that is your victory. Your victory is not in the middle of it. That's why the word says to us, rejoice, give thanks in everything, not because of everything, but while you are in everything, because the victory is on the end when we come out of that everything. So let's look at Joseph. Joseph was able to overcome and go through some hardships because he knew that he was God's chosen and he felt God's purpose on his life, although he didn't quite understand what it meant. Many of us are anticipating that God will tell us our purpose, the full document, you know, he'll give us a dossier and he'll send us off. No, you can't handle it. You can't manage what God has to tell you about his plans and purposes. If God was to tell Joseph, guess what? You're going to go through some really rough times. Your brother going to hate you. They're going to throw you out. You're going to come close to death. You're going to go to a foreign land. That's where you're going to live. You're going to miss your fathers. And then you're going to save Israel. I think Joseph would have just stopped taking care of sheep and go do something else. Because that's just too much to handle. How many of us would have wanted to know God's plan for Martin Luther King? And God would say, people are going to ostracize you. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be on the streets. You're going to be pressured. And then somebody's going to kill you. And then say, yes, yeah, sign me up for that. No. There's a man in the U.S., uh, uh, George Floyd, who was killed the other day. I don't know all the things around it, but this I know that his death triggered an international global response to injustice and wickedness in the US that has not been seen before. There have been other blacks who have been killed, but his death went to almost every nation, people who didn't even speak English. Now I say, God will use that situation to turn things around. But we're talking about Joseph. And so in Psalm 105, 16 to 17, the word says this about Joseph. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provisions of bread. He sent a man before him, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. He sent before who? Them. And who would they be? Israel. He sent Joseph ahead of time in order that Israel might be saved. And if you're not sure that I'm correct, look at Psalm 81 also, verse 5. 
you'll see the same message that God already planned for Joseph to be the forerunner to deliver Israel from this famine that was to come. But for Joseph's, Joseph, sorry, hardships came very early as a young man. Very early because his brothers hated him. As a youth with integrity, he used to report on them. <laughs> I mean, how many of you have um, younger siblings who report on you when you go wrong? You're not so happy about that. That's, that's no fun. They hated him because he was specially loved by Jacob, their father, because he was a child in his old age. They hated him because the father reinforced that love by giving him a coat of many colors. And let me tell you something, like Joseph, because God loves us personally and specially, he treats each one of us as favorites. So it's okay for you to say I'm God's favorite. Say I'm God's favorite. I'm God's favorite. Of course, because I'm God's favorite too. And you don't miss what he tell me. He and I will have our conversation because I'm his favorite. And he will talk to you directly and bless you the way he wants because you're his favorite. So he treats each one of us like that. And you know what he does like Joseph? He places his mantle on us and his mantle has many colors. Blessings of health, blessings of marriage, blessings of prosperity, blessings of healing. All those colors are in the mantle that he places upon us when the hardship comes. And sometimes hardship will come because the world just hates Jesus and you identify with Jesus. So they just hate you and Jesus told us that that would come. And then there are gonna be some other hardships that will come out of our own ignorance or maybe out of our own innocence as we offend people not meaning to. And when you look at what Joseph did, Joseph told his brothers, guess what, guys, you guys who hate me, you're going to bow down to me one day. You know, it's all going to be great. You think they would love him more? Very unlikely. But, you know, he could have rescued himself, you know, but guess what? He got another dream and he didn't learn the first time. And he told them again. I know he added his mother and father. And the father said, why? What? You want me and your mother and your brothers to come bow down to you? You insane? But the word said the father thought about it further. The brothers just hated him and moved on. So sometimes you find in your life you're forced to serve in ways that you never have. And Joseph's hard journey started in a pit. How many of us have found ourselves in a pit? It might be a financial pit. It might be a health pit. It might be a loneliness pit. It could be a divorce pit where when you look up, the distance to the light looks far. The space is confined around you. The place where you are is not pleasant. A pit is not a palace. They threw him in an open place where there might have been insects. It might have been smelly from the damp. It might have had mold. And in our lives, sometimes we feel like that. We feel like we're in a place that is horrible. It's disgusting. It's painful. It's hard. But I tell you, look up. Because as deep as that pit is, is as long as God's arm is. As deep as that pit is, is as long as God's arm is. And soon deliverance came by the Ishmaelites. We want to be delivered by, you know, great chariots and singing um, men and all kinds of fanfare. But sometimes God will send a raven, a carrion, to feed you by the brook while you wait on his next move. Sometimes God will send a slave trader to release you. But don't worry about that because you were looking to come out of the pit and God does. And so he moved him. And you would think that his hardship would be finished, but it wasn't finished because now he went into Potiphar's house and he was a slave. He was a free man before, taking care of sheep, enjoying the sunshine and the breeze. Now he's in Potiphar's house, a slave. 
But even then the word said God was with him. So there is victory in hardship. And he became so good at what he did in asset management, in inventory control, in people, um, HR interactions, that Potiphar said, I don't know what go on in my house. I wake up and I eat and I go, cut this guy's good. God gives you victory and success in those places until a lady by the name of Potiferita. Potiferita, problem, problem, problem. Everywhere you go, there's a Potiferita. And she just wants what she wants. She doesn't care what you want. She doesn't care how it will affect you. She doesn't care that her push has thrown you out of your job. She doesn't care that what she has done or said has caused you to lose favor with your family and for you to go into a prison of sorts. That's not her concern, is Potiferita. She just wants what she wants. And hardship comes again. But even in the prison, the word said God was with him. And he became not the head of the prison, because there was a prison a head person, right? But he became so good that he was the best prisoner yet. He was taking care of men and the movements of assets and resources and goods. And God was with him and caused him to receive a vision. Now, you have to say, thanks, Potiferita, the next time you see her, anywhere you see her, whatever she looks like or whatever he looks like. Say, thank you. You know why? Because that was the access to the palace. If you needed to hear a word from God that would release you, that would bring you into God's place, if you were to receive the blessings of God and it was found in a prison, would you be willing to go? I wouldn't be willing to go. That's why God don't tell you in business. You're too fast. That's not your business. God works all things together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. So he knew that you needed to meet the butler in the prison because the butler was not in the palace. The butler was in the prison. So that's where you had to go. And that's where he went. And when he declared the thing to the, the, the butler and cut it short, eventually the butler remembered him one day, told Pharaoh about him, and he came into the kingdom. Now Joseph is the second highest man in the whole kingdom of Egypt. The whole kingdom, from a teenager taking care of sheep, to a pit dweller, to a slave, to a prisoner, to the highest man. That's why God don't tell you in business. He just let you walk. And that's why we have to walk by faith. We have to take each step by faith. Because God will take us there. But I tell you something. You can overcome. You can overcome. You can have the victories in the midst of those circumstances. Because as a royal priest, you can touch the helm of God's garment in the heavens. You can come to God's throne because he extends his scepter to you. Because that's the God who we serve. And then he calls you a son. So you don't come into his presence like a pauper. You don't come into his presence like a thief. You don't come into his presence like a stranger. You're his son. And so he says, come, those who ask of me must believe that I am, and I am a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So as a child of God, you can be victorious over hardships, but you can also be victorious over earthly opposition. And it's all because of the identity you have in Christ. You can come into victory over earthly opposition. Because your identity is in the omnipotent God, you should not fear those who resist you. Those who resist the purpose of God. Those who are seeking to push back against the work of God in your life. Because God himself will give you victory. God is like the, the father that we talk about at school. I'm going to tell my father, big father, come and address the matter. We're not talking about beating teachers because that's illegal and wrong. 
with saying that when you call on your father, your father is going to turn up and say, what happened here? Why is my son like this? Why are you opposing him? And he will touch the highest places and cause things to move. The word of God says, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it any which way he wants. That's the father I want to turn up in my difficult situations. And so out of jealousy and hate, the Chaldeans, who were in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, plotted to destroy Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Just on the basis of their faith, they hated them. But those Hebrews were unafraid. Unafraid. The word in Daniel 3, 16 to 17 says this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king. They're talking to the king, you know. Them bold face, plain. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this were the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hands. Take that and know that God can and will. And you have to stand in that faith because that's who you are, a son of God. You're a child of this big king. You're a child of this mighty God who will step in and deliver you from the hands of even those who consider themselves demigods. And God answered the Hebrews and protected them from the fire, which led them to victory over their enemies. And I'm telling you, the nature of God's victory, when God winning you know, God don't just win and take the cup and walk away. God fire confetti in the air. God blow a vuvuzela in your space. Amen? God has a marching band before you. He takes you into places before, places where you have never been before. Because the victory that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got over their enemies was that God promote them in the face. Promote them and say, these are my sons. And let it be known, there is no God who can deliver like this. That's what Nebuchadnezzar says. There is no other God who can deliver it like this. Daniel 3, 29 tells us. David, like a shepherd worshiper, also knew his identity. And his identity allowed him to walk in victory. It allowed him to stand up when the children of Israel and the armies were afraid of this huge man when they describe it. His weaponry, too heavy for one man to carry. His javelin, taller than everybody else. And way holy, I mean, if I tried to throw that, I'd probably end up dropping it on my foot. You know, it's like, boom. Too heavy, massive man. Everybody afraid, standing around. David said, what is this? This uncircumcised Philistine. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? And you can read the rest of it. David says, you know what? You came to me with sword, spear, javelin. But I come to you with something bigger than that. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then God blow the confetti. And then God blow the vuvuzela. And then God send the marching band before you. Because not only was the great, mighty warrior Goliath stumped by a stone, a river stone, he got his head cut off by his own sword. God don't play like that. So just be careful. You are a child of God. You have to understand who your God is and understand who you are so that you're not afraid of those who would oppose you. David's heart was to honor his God. He knew who he was. He knew his identity. He knew he was beloved of God. He knew he was a chosen person. And he walked in that boldness. Ironically, there's a man called Haman who had determined that he was going to wipe out Israel because he hated them. And you know what happened to him? Vuvuzela. 
confetti. <laughs> because he was hung on the very gallows that he designed. He got a special contractor to come out and design the gallows that he could have killed Mordecai. But God said, not this time. Not my people. Not in my presence. And he himself was hung. You can check it out in Esther 7, verse 10. As a child of God, then, you can be victorious because you know who you are over hardships. You can know who you are and be victorious in the midst of the opposition of men, but you can also be victorious against spiritual forces. Remember, you know, I'm seeing you, but I'm only seeing an infinitesimal small part of who you are because your spirit is behind those eyes. Your spirit is behind those jobs. And your spirit is big. Because God is big. God is awesome. Amen? And so you must be ready to stand against spiritual forces which are always operating in the earth. But because we are in the earth, and because we are ambassadors of Christ, as 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we are ambassadors of Christ in the earth. We need letters of credence, or letters, a letter of credentials, or credentials, as a part of the formal instrument of us working in the earth. So what do I really mean by that and what's the relevance of that? Your credentials in the earth as a sojourner is the power of the Holy Spirit. You are not authorized to act on behalf of Jesus Christ unless the Holy Spirit has come and dwelt and inhabited you. Because the Holy Spirit is a seal it's a marriage ring that God puts on you to say, you are mine and I'm yours. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you connects you with your father. It causes your spirit that was dead to come alive in Christ. It takes you away from the father that you had, which was Satan, to the father who has now received you, which is God. Amen. So having the Holy Spirit as your credential to walk in the earth as an ambassador of Christ is critical. And so in Acts 1, 8, it says, it said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so Paul knew how important that was. He went to Ephesus, and he spoke to the brethren that were there, and he said, have you guys received the Holy Spirit? Have you gotten your credentials yet? Have you gotten your letters to, to walk in the earth and to represent Christ? And he said, the, the who what? He said, the Holy Spirit. They who who? No, the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit? He said, no, we never hear about that. Who is that? How do we get that? And so he prayed with them. He had them baptized, and the word said they received the Holy Spirit. And you understand how important that was because Paul demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the ambassador for Christ. In Acts 19, 11 to 12, it says, No, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them, and the evil spirit went out from them. Not because Paul spoke to them, but because the God who dwells in Paul says, leave. Because the God who dwells in Paul and gave him these letters of accreditation says, rise up and walk. Because he says, diseases leave. So we must have the Holy Spirit. One of our speakers two weeks ago told us about the urgency, the importance of having the Holy Spirit in our daily lives as believers. 
believers, that's part of our identity. That's who we are, ambassadors of Christ, sons of God. That's who we are, and we need to have the Holy Spirit with us, and we need to have him everywhere that we go, and we need to be sensitive to his leading. Not to his bawling out, because if God has to ball out to you, you're gone far. Believe me. If you are like Balaam, who waits until God tells you two times no, and the third time you say, all right, go on. Balaam said, yes, God said yes. No, God didn't say yes. God said, I'm tired of you coming to me. Do whatever you want. And Balaam heads out. And then when he gets to a point, donkey, stop. He said, what is going on here? And he tries to get the donkey to move. The donkey starts to talk. No, you tell me. If donkey talk to you, you know, Donkey can't go about your business because I go in the other direction. And he was still interested in going. Don't wait until God has to shout to you. Listen to the still small voice. Listen. And because of the Holy Spirit and the credentials, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, and we all know the scripture, tells us the awesome power that comes by being a child of God and understanding our authority. For though we walk in the flesh, you look at me, you see my baldness, you see my glasses, you see my complexion. No, no, no. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're not going out there with, with guns and glocks. And M16s, we're not going out there with knives and spears to hurt anybody. That's not our weapon. They are not carnal, but they are mighty. Say mighty. They are mighty in God because the spiritual forces in the earth are strong. And you need a mighty weapon. You're not going to go out there, I mean, those who are in the military. You're not going to run out in the middle of a battlefield with stones. To throw after what? Missiles? How does that work? No. You need mighty weapons from a mighty God. To do what? To pull down strongholds. Are there strongholds in your office? In your community? In your homes? You need a mighty weapon from a mighty God to pull them down. That's why we fasted. That's why we fasted over the week. Because sometimes you need to raise up and empower the weapons that you have by agreement. To raise up and empower the weapons that you already have by having a spirit have full dominance because you put your body under subjection. That's why we fast. That's why we pray. We reach out as royal priests to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the mighty God. And we pull down strongholds. And we cast down arguments or imaginations social media has caused all kinds of people to have a platform people who should not be heard because their thoughts are so corrupt so destructive but they have access and we need to by God pull down those arguments that sound good a man who wakes up in the morning and feels like he's a woman so he dresses up and then tomorrow he feels like a child, so he goes to kindergarten. And the next day he feels like an animal, so he goes and sits in a kennel. And his parents tell him, well, whatever works for you there. No, foolish arguments and imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against knowledge and truth of God. Every thought must be brought captive into the obedience of Christ. That's why we have to be ambassadors with our credentials. Make sure you have your credentials because we have to bring the arguments and the strongholds and the high things and the thoughts into obedience of Christ and be ready to punish every disobedience when our own obedience is fulfilled. So today we don't war in the natural, we war in the spiritual. We war against darkness, we war against sickness and disease and corruption and lawlessness and lewdness and the occult. We require a mighty kingdom response in order to have victory because of who we are in Christ. I'm going to invite the praise and worship team to come back.
because we're going to close out. We need to declare and stand on who we are, recognizing all the things that we are, recognizing that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, recognizing that we are the chosen of God, we're the children of God, recognizing that we're victorious over hardships, we're victorious over oppositions in the earth, we're victorious over oppositions in the spirit. We have the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And we can resist the enemy. Amen. If you have already accepted Christ, the chief cornerstone, as 1 Peter 2 says, if we have received him into our lives, then we must walk with the credentials God gives us from the Holy Spirit. Then we are equipped for victories against hardship and natural opposition and spiritual opposition. But if you have not yet been endowed with your letter of credentials, it's not too late. You can ask the, Holy, you can ask the Father. The Father knows how to give good gifts to those who ask him. If you're not saved today, today is the acceptable day of the Lord. Today. The word says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Today we ask you, today we implore you, today we invite you to make sure that you are clear on your identity. Make sure that you are clear on your spiritual identity in Christ. That you are a conqueror. You are a soldier. That you are the victorious. That you are a son of God. That your royal priesthood, that you're chosen of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, we give you thanks for your call in our lives. We thank you for the release by your spirit. We thank you for the word which has gone out. And that we will all walk, Father, with the identity of children of Christ. That we will tear down imaginations and strongholds and those wicked things. That we will walk in victory in hard times. That we will walk in victory against opposition. I will walk in victory against the spiritual wickedness in the earth. Hallelujah, because we know who we are. Say, we know who we are. We know who we are. Say, I know who I am. I know who I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.